Hello again, class, and welcome to our presentation, The Social Gospel and Introduction. So in this presentation, we are going to define what is meant by the social gospel movement. We'll talk about two major social gospel movement figures, Washington Gladden and Walter Rauschenbusch. We will review some conclusions, and then we will talk about what happened to the social gospel movement. So what is the social gospel? So the social gospel refers to the late 19th to early 20th century American Christian religious movement that emphasizes political and economic justice as the central tenet of Christianity. That is, for social gospelers, the purpose of Christianity is to redeem society. How? By cleansing society of social sin through economic and political reform, by creating a new society of perfect justice to bring the kingdom of God to earth, and by reforming humanity and preparing it for the coming of the heavenly kingdom. In other words, the main thesis of the social gospel movement is the following. The key to human salvation is social salvation. And as Washington Gladden writes, the end of Christianity is twofold, a perfect man and a perfect society. These purposes are never separated. They cannot be separated. No man can be redeemed and saved alone. No community can be reformed and elevated save as the individuals of which it is composed are regenerated. So for people like Washington Gladden and the other social gospelers, human salvation depends upon social salvation. So if you want to reform humanity, if you want to reform the individual, you must reform society first. And that is the central thesis of Christianity. Now, one other small detail, the, gospel, the social gospel movement is considered to be a social movement of optimism, meaning social gospelers were optimistic about humanity's desire to be moral and to support socioeconomic reform. Now, arguably, this optimism resulted in the social gospel's early success, but we can also argue that this optimism also led to its downfall, which we will talk about later. So with this in mind, let's take a look at two of the most prominent figures of the social gospel movement, Washington Gladden and Walter Rauschenbusch. So Washington Gladden was born in Pottsgrove, Pennsylvania in 1836. He is a congregational pastor, writer, and activist, and served most of his career in Massachusetts and Ohio, initially preaching to the business class, but later became involved in union advocacy and protest movements. Now for Gladden, what is the greatest social sin? Because remember, social gospelers are concerned with the sins of society as a whole. Well, for Gladden, there are two, the exploitation of workers by the industrial capitalist system and predatory competition. So in other words, industrial capitalism and competition, he believes, run contrary to Christian principles. So how is society be, to be reformed? Well, for Gladden, you must preach to the entrepreneurial class, the business class, on how to be a good Christian employer. He also supported certain initiatives like profit sharing for the wage receiving class. And he also supported the existence of unions to fight for the rights of workers. And what is the ideal society for Washington Gladden? a Christianized form of democratic capitalism. In other words, Gladden wanted to keep the system of capitalism in place in America, but he wanted to basically reform the system with Christian principles of charity, fairness, and selfless love. Now, our second figure is Walter Rauschenbusch, and he was born in Rochester, New York in 1861. He was a Baptist pastor, professor, and theologian, and he became influenced by the social gospel movement while serving at an impoverished church in Manhattan. Now, like Washington Gladden, Walter Rauschenbusch argued that the greatest social sin 
is once again the exploitation of workers by the industrial capitalist system as well as predatory competition. So how is society to be reformed according to Rauschenbusch? Well, for him, American society needs to be completely restructured and Christianized, meaning the restructuring of values in accordance with the Sermon on the Mount or the teachings of Jesus. In other words, society must be reformed and Christianized in accordance with Jesus' moral teachings. And as Rauschenbusch writes, we do not want less religion, we want more. But it must be a religion that gets its orientation from the kingdom of God. To concentrate our efforts on personal salvation or on soul culture comes close to refined selfishness. All of us who have been trained in egotistic religion need a conversion to Christian Christianity, even if we are bishops or theological professors. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and God's righteousness and the salvation of your souls will be added to you. So for Rauschenbusch, Christianity itself needs to be reformed so that it is not about individual salvation, but social salvation. And once Christianity is reformed, it can go about reforming society. And for Rauschenbusch, what is the ideal reform society? A democratic socialist republic. Well, what is that? For Rauschenbusch, a democratic socialist republic is a society in which, one, citizens are granted voting rights as in any democracy, but there is an equal distribution of rights and material resources to all citizens, and there is cooperative ownership or a kind of democratic ownership by the workers of the means of production, meaning that the workers own the factories. Um, so as we can see, this is kind of a, a blend between democracy, and socialism. So in conclusion, put simply, whereas Washington Gladden wanted to reform the American capitalist society with Christian principles, Walter Rauschenbusch wanted to completely dismantle the capitalist system, replacing it with a Christianized form of democratic socialism. So whereas Gladden believed that capitalism could be reformed so that it was kind of more in tune with Christian teachings, Rauschenbusch believed that capitalism simply is not compatible with capitalism, that indeed socialism is actually more compatible with Christian belief. Now, what happened to the social gospel movement? Why don't we really hear about it much today? Well, the social gospel movement gradually declined after the First and Second World Wars. Okay, why? Well, the theory is that Americans no longer felt optimistic about the human desire for morality and social progress. That is, after the first two world wars, um, people in the West just became more cynical about human nature and were just not as optimistic about the human drive to do good. And therefore, the social gospel just fell out of favor. However, despite its decline, many of the central tenets of the social gospel movement profoundly influenced later Christian social movements such as the civil rights movement, Christian socialism, uh, as well as both Roman Catholic and Protestant uh, flavors of liberation theology. I will um, do a little commercial for this particular um, <coughs> YouTube presentation. What is the Gospel by R.C. Sproul? R.C. Sproul is no longer with us, but they captured a lot of his uh, teachings in video and audio snippets. You can get uh, the Ligonier series that I've mentioned many times here. Um, you can get a daily um, dispatch with uh, a life of a minute, minute and a half from Sproul or some of his uh, uh, counterparts. Uh, about some aspect of theology related to um, this historical development or going all the way back. But that particular lecture is a long one. It's 44 minutes long. And it's the best answer that I know to ask the question which I asked myself last year or a year before for a shorthand answer of what is the gospel. The social gospel has a very clear definition, but I want 
you to keep in, in your mind for all that we talk about today or all that we continue to talk about with the uh, fundamentalists on the right and the liberals or the modernists or the social gospelists on the left. Ask yourself as you hear these, where's Jesus in this? You know, what what are they what are they offering to you in terms of a clearer understanding of who Jesus is and what the gospel was? And what Stroll did for me in that uh, 44 minute segment is he talked about how the idea of gospel kind of morphs in the New Testament. And I, I will come back to that from time to time. But the very word gospel is misunderstood in terms of how we translate it and how we use. The Greek word is euangelion. And euangelion has to do with Good news. What kind of good news? Generally speaking, it's political good news. Generally speaking, for the ancients, it was after there was a successful military campaign by one of the emperors, they came strolling back, they would send out someone to, as a runner to announce, here we come, you know, we're coming back, we have good news, we have triumphed, you're safe. You know, the world is, the world is, is going to be in, in good shape. Nowadays, we um, generally accept, most scholars would, would, would agree that the Gospel of Mark came first, not Matthew, as was commonly thought for a long time. And Mark opens up the very first words that Jesus pronounces in his... Um, in his uh, teaching, as he gets started on his his mission, is repent and believe the good news. What's the good news that he says? The kingdom of God is at hand. At hand. It's right there. It's it's coming right around you. So where I started with that, I said, okay, that's it. It's not what we thought about when I was growing up in the Missouri Synod. The good news was. We are saved by Jesus' atoning sacrifice. That's the good news. Well, it's good news, all right. But it's not how the <clears throat> gospel starts. But as you follow it, what Sproul does as he shows how it develops all the way through the end of the, of the New Testament. And by the end of the New Testament, in Paul's writings, the gospel is Jesus himself. The fascinating tour that that you can take. Now the social gospel people, that's kind of the political or the action arm, as it were, of the modernists. The ones who we've been calling liberals. Religious liberals are not the same as political liberals, but they have a lot in common, especially including the action arm that, that um, you, you saw in terms of what they're talking about. But they have a spectrum too. So the two most famous guys for the social gospel are the ones they talked about, Washington Gladden and Walter Rauschenbusch. It's, it's kind of interesting to me personally because they touch on, on um, periods in my life that I was not in tune with what's being discussed here. But we were there. Ann and I were there as I moved, you know, through my professional life. We spent some years in Rochester, and I almost got a job at the University of Rochester. Would have loved it. And I had no clue that Rochester was a hotbed of, you remember when we talked about uh, Charles Grandison Finney and the burned over <coughs> district that had just a kind of a succession of, of uh, revivalists coming through. and cranking them up and getting them fired up. That's where it got this idea of being the burned over district. Walter Rauschenbusch comes out of that tradition. His dad is, I think, the chair of one of the, um, one of the scholarly departments at the university. I don't know if it was the University of Rochester 
or if it was another university in the area. But anyway, he was kind of like the head theologian. And so Walter was a brilliant kid, and he went off and got his credentials. He got the highest that you could get. But he decided that he didn't want to follow his dad into academia right away. He wanted to get um, kind of immersed in the real world. So he went to a place in New York City that was about as bad from the standpoint of slums and exploited workers and you know everything horrific about the underclass. It was, it was so bad they called it Hell's Kitchen. So he was the pastor in Hell's Kitchen. And he formed these ideas that said, we can't go on like this. Capitalism is rapacious. Capitalism is destroying people. Capitalism is taking advantage of people. He's not a communist, but he's pretty well zapped into socialism as, as the answer. What is socialism? Well, socialism is no private ownership of big industry. That's the, the quickest way I could sum it up. They call it the means of production. You know, If there's a major industry that, that everybody needs, we have some forms of socialism even today. The first big example was during uh, the Depression era. And FDR took us over and the Tennessee Valley Authority was the first big experiment with public ownership of a gigantic concern to provide flood control relief and electricity. It was a huge success. You know, Hoover Dam for our area, same, same kind of an idea. So Rauschenbusch goes down that direction. Washington Gladden, not so far. Washington Gladden is actually kind of conservative when he starts. He's a regular pastor at, at the beginning of this. And he's in Columbus, Ohio for most of his time. I tried to get a job at Columbus, Ohio too. I interviewed there and uh, I blew the interview because I was fiddling. This was the first time I'd ever had a, had a hearing aid and I was trying to, <laughs> and I had my hand on my ear I think, the, whole, the whole time that I was interviewing there. But Columbus was an interesting city, and I had no clue that it was this hotbed of religious fervor, thanks to Walt, Walt Washington Gladden. He's a local hero now. They have a park and statue dedicated to him and all kinds of stuff. Wound up on the city council, kind of a, a great city father by the time it's done. But as it begins, there's a mining strike in the area, and he's taking the position that most conservatives did at the time, which was, you don't do away with the system, you become part of it. So save some money by stock in the company, you become a part owner, you, you, know, you, you share the wealth and so forth. Trouble is, he found very quickly that people in his congregation, wealthy people in his congregation, were the owners of these mines and they mashed the strike down and they broke it and they sent the workers back with actually less wages, I think the story went, than they had at the start of the strike. Why? Because they could. They, they could get away with it. And he said, this is wrong. And increasingly he became aware of underclass kinds of issues and became more and more outspoken you kind of wonder if he kept his, his congregation together and, and kept some of those big givers, you know, in his congregation by the time he's done, because he was pushing really hard on them and saying, you, you, need, to, you need to revise the way that, that you're, you're handling your workers, the way you're working. So what they had in common was this political action idea of sharing the wealth, and theologically, get ready for this now, get your thinking caps on. The justification for it or the argument in favor of it from the standpoint of scripture is this is the kingdom of God. That's our job here, to put the kingdom of God in place. 
All right, now let me ask you, how does that square with your understanding of the kingdom of God? In all the preaching that you've heard, it's the most important, most frequent topic that Jesus talks about. He talks about the kingdom of God. Never defines it. Never sits down and says, this is it. So, from what you've heard, from what your understanding is, how does that, how does that fit? Does that work? Well, actually, yes. Because, and I mean, to an extent, because Jesus was very much for caring for the, the weak, the poor, yep. the widow, the... That's a good, that's a good point. That's, that's part of their argument. Look at what Jesus did. Don't just look at what he said. Who did he make friends with? Who did he pal around with? Did he go with the industrialists of his day? The fringes of society. The fringes. Yeah. 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 He's, he's working with the weakest, working. the most outcast, the most dispossessed, the most. So score one for, for them. Keep going. <laughs> Well, what, uh, what's the time frame of, of roughly for these uh, two evangelists or, or got the, the two we mentioned? What what years are we talking about? Well, turn of the century. The you know, basically the, the first 20 years of, of the 20th century from just before <laughs> really 1900 to World War One. Were they more re originalistic in the social idea or did that come, did they get some idea from Lenin or if you will. Ask me again? Did, did they come up with the social Christianity on their own? Or, yeah, was, that, or was, was that part of, because I know around that time, you know, 15, you know, 1915-ish, you had Lenin, right? Yeah, I, so, I don't think Tony ever sat down and said, let's, let's start a movement and let's call it social gospel. Right, no, I understand that. I was just curious where the timeline was, yeah. whether, they're, whether maybe they heard a little bit from this guy and brought it in, or if they originated it themselves. I would say that they originated the, the particular clustering of ideas that I'm talking about. Now, having said that, if you go to the secular side, this is the this is the age of Teddy Roosevelt and trust busting and the progressive era. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a political side to this too, but the political side in America has never been on the side for socialism. Mm -hmm. Even now, you may remember um, that uh, John McCain uh, struggled with that concept in in his campaign because his people were very anxious to label um, Democratic candidates, Obama in particular, as a socialist. And he was, he was uncomfortable with that. I think he had a, had a mixed emotion you know, in his process. Certainly the Democratic Party in the US since Reconstruction has, has moved more in that direction, more on the more on the left, <laughs> um, and the left idea would be more inclined toward government involvement as opposed to government ownership. Mm -hmm. The idea of let's bring about equality, let's let's engage the government in in making things more more equal, whereas the the notion of the um, the right, the political right, was probably put best in the Reagan era that said, if you take care of the people at the top, the wealth will trickle, trickle down. down. <laughs> and everybody will benefit. The old expression is a rising tide Raises lifts all, all boats. Everybody will be better. You'll, you'll have more jobs, everything will be taken care of. So that's, the, that's the, the contest from the secular side. But this is one aspect that I wanted you to keep in your mind. It's, it's related, but it's not central to the theological battle that's gonna go on in this conflict that we're talking about between fundamentalists and modernists or liberals on the other side. 
that's going to go along right at the same time. So one of the messages that I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind as, as we think about this is that this is a really complex time. It's not as easy as I thought it was going on. I mean, you can come up with some simple, simple thoughts that said, well, it's either this or that. So last week we looked at one of the preachers that's on the political left, identified as a liberal, and I would ask the same question that you keep in mind. I've got uh, some people asked me to reprint the whole sermon that he gave that we focused on last week. His, his focus is, shall the fundamentalists win? And his, his thought was, all these ideas that they have, that they've put together, they're not letting anybody else into the, into the tent, as it were. They're, they're sucking all the oxygen in the debate by insisting that it has their way or the highway. And he said, that's not the way it should, should be. The way it should be is we should have a big tent that everybody can bring their ideas and we can talk about what does the gospel mean to us. And he says, is it okay to have them kick out those who disagree with him? And obviously he's going to say no. And he challenges four out of five in his sermon of the basic doctrines that the fundamentalists were pushing that I want to reveal with you um, today. And he, and he basically tries his best to <coughs> knock the blocks out from under it. So he's combative. So he says, shall a fundamentalist win? Do we let them kick us out? So how do you think that ended up? As Dr. Phil would say, how's that working for you? Uh, how, how, did he, how, did he, how did he do? Did he prevail? No, there's some of that in our society now. No, I'm, think, think back to, uh, think back to that, that particular church and that particular pastor. He made, it, it was so popular and so provocative a uh, sermon that he was asked to reprint it and pass it around. They made 130,000 copies of it. Sounds like a lot until you put it next to what the fundamentalists were doing with the tracts that became 12 different books called The Fundamentals of Testimony to the Truth. And there was millions of those that went out to every everyone having anything to do with the church anywhere in the U.S. and also abroad. And I want to go back through that a little bit. So what do you suppose happened to him? Did he prevail? Did he keep his church? He got kicked out. But the, the current Rockefeller built him a new one, and it was gorgeous. So for the rest of his life, he had a big church in New York that he continued um, to preach down that path. So let's, let's put this in context and see if I can give you a timeline. This might help a little bit, Tony. I've got two columns here, the left, column as you look at it is um, things that happen that, that, that are more on the fundamental side. I should have flipped it because the fundamentals are on the right. <laughs> but, you know, politically. You can handle it. So that's just... <laughs> so here's my sources. The Gospel Coalition is an interesting group. They're starting to publish a lot now. They've only been around a few years. Um, I like a lot of what they they do. The other one is is a kind of a standard historical review. So here we go. We're pushing into the um, the 20th century. We talked about this on and off from time to time. The Niagara Bible conferences. These are put together by no less than Dwight Moody, 
But he doesn't have to do very much because there's a guy by the name of James Brooks that is organizing him out of St. Louis. And you got to remember, look at this date. As they begin, it's right after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. So what does that mean for ministers in the West talking with ministers in the East? It's easier. Yeah. They can get together, they can powwow, and they can, they can give it and they can trade ideas, and that's what they start doing. And they said, let's strategize on how we can respond to what's going on in the world that we don't like religiously. These people that are challenging the ideas about what the Bible says and how, what it means, let's see if we can't have a counterforce. And most historians, I think, would say, this is really where fundamentalism gets its start. This is really where it's beginning. Now, what's interesting about this from our standpoint, you know, looking back at it historically, is not just getting a date to, to fix when things started, but, but all the movements that are going on with it, particularly with Moody, and the connections that these conferences make. They're based on conferences that we talked about a little bit before over in England. But Brooks, James Brooks is an enthusiast of Darby. Who's Darby? Charles knows Darby from um, the British system is a guy who, if I'm remembering it correctly, actually is an American, but did his, did his work in the British Isles in Scotland, and uh, I think it was Scotland, and broke with that church when it was called upon to, to take an oath of allegiance to the King of England. Man, I wasn't going to do that. But he had ideas about what the Bible, how the Bible came together and, and, and what it said. And he's the father, the creator, the, the, the um, designer of premillennial dispensationalism. And James Brooks, back in America, hears him talk and likes this a lot. So as he's organizing these conferences around Lake Niagara and, and they, they meet, if not annually, quite frequently uh, to discuss these, areas, he's pushing dispensationalism. So dispensationalism becomes one of the three legs or four legs of the stool that, that holds uh, that holds the fundamentalist world together. And eventually, so go ahead. Wait. What's this? this I'll, I'll get there. Okay. You know, that. That's that's the idea that um, is the primary theological backdrop for all of the non-aligned churches in America today. It's the biggest single. Well, there's. I shouldn't say it's single because it's a cluster of <coughs> ideas that fit together. So the system of thought is basically that over time, God has, according to the Bible, they say, Darby says, God has revealed himself to his people in different ways, but they mess it up. So he tries another way, and each time he tries, leading up to some sort of catastrophe. That's called a dispensation. So up to the flood is a dispensation, up to the Tower of Babel is a dispensation, and there are going to be seven all total. I'm, I'm talking in the purest sense. There's lots of variations over time because other people get real enamored of it and they try and tack on ideas. But basically, seven dispensations, and that takes us up to the present day, and all of a sudden, there are no, no more dispensations for a while. Why? Because God is going to intervene and stop the clock because everything up to that time was for the Jews. Now we have to give the Christians a chance to get out of there. 
because the way it's going to happen next is going to be a new calamity as predicted in Daniel and Revelation primarily. And the Christians get to escape if they're good Christians. What do they call that? Rapture. Yeah, someone said it. Rapture. Rapture. The idea of rapture is Jesus will come back and he'll rescue his church for the time being. They don't have to go through what the Jews have to go through because everything was related to the Jews. So we call that the church age. That's what we're in right now. But it could end any second. You know, Jesus could come back and say, this, this time is, is up. You've had your chance. Now, now we call forth, you know, the end. And so it's a big system that we'll talk about in a second again as to how that got its hook in. But basically, if you're talking about um, any non-aligned church, any so-called non-mainline church, they probably are dispensationals in all probability. And the only place where it's strong, the only place where in the whole world where, uh, where uh, there is a lot of activity saying this is, this is what we should, should pay our attention to and, and what we should study is America. It, it is not in vogue in England. It is not in vogue in Scotland. There's some in Canada, but that's about it. That's pretty much it. And so two sessions from today, I want to end this series just focusing on dispensational, just, just digging into that and, and trying to show you what some of the passages are that they are relying on and let you be your own judge. Does that sound logical or reasonable or not? Okay. I don't know much about John Fisk, but <clears throat> what, what I have him on here for is to show again how the timeline is kind of oscillating back and forth and, and it going on at the same time and clashing. Systematic theology is putting it all together such that it fits. And the conflict that lots of people believe is under undergoing what what is driving fundamentalism versus modernism is the rise of science. So next week what I want to do is show the clash from the standpoint of what science is saying and and how science is affecting how people see the Bible, how they see creation, and especially even though I can only really do chapter one because chapter two happens much later in our lifetimes, the concept of what? What's the big cause to love in, in the scientific world? We still see it today. Science says what happened in creation? How, how did creation work? Evolution. Evolution. Someone Evolution. Evolution. Yeah, yeah. In other words, the fundamentalists would say, God said, let there be light. There was light. God says, let us make man. In our own image. In his own image. Yeah, image. in our image. And Darwin says, that's not really supportable by the facts, insofar as we can tell from looking at it. And so there's a huge clash. All right. While this is going on, <clears throat> the Presbyterian Church is one big focus of this clash. The Presbyterians, by and large, are of what, what, what's, who's their hero? Ours is Luther, theirs is? Knox. Someone? Knox. Calvin. It's Calvin. Well, it's Calvin. Okay. And their reaction is, Calvin got it right. We need to pay attention to the world as the Reformation laid it out. And um, <clears throat> that's pretty much cut and dry. The two names that, that show up that are the drivers in their early stage are uh, Warfield, who's one of the, the teachers of theology, and the son of Charles Hodge, <clears throat> who is an equal partner in terms of being a, a theologian of note. 
and they're saying we need to drive a stake in the ground and say no more you know God said it that's it scripture is right but the the Princeton types the Princetonians have a have a fail safe and I like it and and I think we could probably work with it and probably most of us wouldn't have a, a real big problem with it because instead of saying scripture is exactly as we see it in the King James Version they're saying scripture as it was originally given to the original prophet to the original originator before it got written down and transferred then it was in Aaron. Then it was the, 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 the voice of God talking. Now, they don't say, with, with the exceptions of where Scripture itself says, write this down. With that exception, they don't say that God grabbed a hold of, of the hand and, and forced the quill to, you know, to, to write the ink. Muslims do. Christians don't. The Quran is supposedly dictated by God. Allah said, write this down just like god talked to ezekiel and said write this down and john the revelator in revelation once or twice you know the messenger says to john write this down don't let it go away after but otherwise we follow the way that 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 peter said in his in his uh letters he said holy men of god were inspired well what does that mean that means they get to use their own language and our and the way we see it today. So it was correct and it was inerrant when it was first, but we don't have that. I had a friend in our old church that when he would encounter fundamentalists <clears throat> who would say scripture is inerrant, he'd say, you're exactly right. I absolutely agree with you. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> Which translation do we, are we talking about? And what what begins scientifically that we'll talk about some more next week is one of Pastor Jay's favorites. He put me up to it early on. Is start with the question of how good is our language to describe God? How how good are we at, at capturing the reality that's there? You, you have to use allegory. You, you have to use words that are descriptors, but not, not perfect enunciators of this is exactly the, the essence. We have to pick at the peripherals and, and try and get an overall picture because, you know, it's just too much. You know, we, we can't get there. So part of the question to start with is, what is inerrant? What does that mean? What does without error mean? Jerry Falwell in our time comes out and he says, Scripture is exactly what it says, and that's true with respect to science and geography as well as theology. Whatever, whatever the Bible says, that's it. And I think he probably meant King James, because that's, that's, where, they, that's where they stand from. Okay, next up. The Society of Biblical Literature. Let's see if I can find that. This shocked me. Uh, where are you? Is that it? Uh, I've lost it. Anyway, you can look this up online. It's still around. The Society of Biblical Literature is still around. The programs that they have are fascinating. The idea of the Society of, of Biblical Literature is to say, let's bring academe, let's bring scientific knowledge, let's bring an approach that is scholarly to the Bible, and then let's share what we found. And let's make that available in such a way that um, that that people can follow it. It doesn't just have to be with with scientists in the in the cloister and in the in the academic setting. And look at the date. 
the American Bible Society takes off during this time. They're still around too. But the idea is we want to have the, the broadest cross-section of knowledge brought to bear on what scripture is saying and, and what it means because we want to get closer to what God is saying. What's wrong with that? Well, fundamentalists would say, we already know what God's saying. You know, it's right there, it's on the page. Can't you read? You know, it's, it's there for everybody to see. So we talked a little bit about Moody on and off. Moody devises a strategy after his church burns down and he goes abroad and becomes famous. He devises a strategy that today we would call a Bible college. Brand new idea back then. You need people who follow this line of logic to man your churches. And we've already seen that in the, the Western movement, there's a, a, re, a rejection in the revivalist world of those who went to seminary to just get deeper and deeper into it and talk in highfalutin language. We want people to talk in everyday language that study the Bible for the Bible's sake, not study it for what Calvin said or what Luther said or what someone else said, and especially not what the Pope said. Certainly don't want that. So what you need is people that immerse themselves in the Bible, we call it Biblicism, and it's a dangerous track to follow if you become worshipers of the scripture, worshipers of the Bible instead of worshipers of Jesus. So we don't believe in the Lutheran world, the Protestant world, we don't believe in a system of irreversible doctrines we believe in a relationship with a person. Jesus actually lived. He actually was here. He actually taught. He actually gave us this system to work with. But he didn't say the system is what saves you. That's what the Pharisees were working on. You know, that was that was their take. So Moody starts a process that today has hundreds of schools like that varying in in sophistication and varying in size. And most of them have um, enough financial support. So if you're coming straight off the farm and you can't afford college, a way will be found for you if you're committed, you know, to, to get this, to get this. Because we've got a whole bunch of, of churches that we've got a man with people that you know, are, are, are going to be able to, to work with the folks that want to come to church and want to have a pastor talk with them every week. There's a church over by where I live um, that's historically connected to Lutherandom through the, the Grace Brethren uh, world. But they're, they're like other non-denominational churches in that every church is kind of separate and on its own. And they had a wonderful pastor who I did Bible study with. Uh, did, I went to his Bible study for many years before he retired. And the church was never able to support him more than half time. And finally, even though they had wonderful property in Alta Loma, right next to where we live, it's not a cheap place to live. The, the, the property could have been sold for well over a million, you know, uh, some years back. They had the most remarkable thing that I think I've ever seen in, in church history that, that happened when he retired. They agreed that they could not afford and would not afford to call a pastor. So they agreed to basically dissolve themselves and let another Grace Brethren Church out in, um, it was out by, it was Simi Valley, let them take over the church and they literally moved people from Simi Valley to come in, five families, to come in and start a new church there. And they just signed the deed over. 
and they said, we trust you to, to run what was our church and we'll worship with you. So I went to see what this new pastor was like. And basically, he was just ripping off Bible verses of old sermon, one after the other. And I thought, that's not very inspiring to me, but you know, a lot of folks had their Bibles on their laps and they were following right along and good stuff as far as they were concerned. So biblicism on the one hand versus learned exegesis, which means let's dig into it and let's find out what, what the meaning was. Let's find out what the words are actually saying. Let's do what Pastor Jay mentioned, you know, today. Let's let's look at alternate translations of of the Greek and see what they were what they were trying to get across to us. Here comes Gladden at the end of the end of the century. He starts and he writes, you're, you're not gonna like this. His first big book where he crashes the, the system is called Who Wrote the Gospel? And he's basically saying not who you thought it was. And this is part of the challenge that um, that becomes a cause to live, particularly the Old Testament, and particularly what what <coughs> books um, above all else, the first Pentateuch, by which we have a separate name for. We call it the Pentateuch. Yeah, the Pentateuch. Jews would call it the books of Moses. Why did they do that? Moses wrote them. Of course. Moses wrote them. Of course. <laughs> Washington Gladden says, not so fast. He's not the first one to say this, but in the process, he's going to challenge pretty much all through. You can find a lot of books like that now that say the, the authorship of scripture is tough to pin down, except with letters that are, that are identified as such, particularly Paul. You really, you really can't get there from here. You really, you really can't say, here's the one guy that, that, that absolutely hits it. Even Isaiah, the most quoted prophet in the New Testament, there's probably at least three different Isaiahs, you know, showing up, first, second, and third. Interesting <laughs> stuff. So Washington Gladden kind of, kind of breaks into, you know, Red Rover, Red Rover, and Washington right over. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to break the chain. He's, he's, going to, he's going to crash through. Charles Briggs is a theologian that gets hired on to the staff at um, Union Theological Seminary. If you look at the, the name Union Theological Seminary, what does that convey to you to start? First word. Does that relate back to the Civil War, or does that relate to it's a, unionization? No. This is the, the war within the Calvinist world. You may remember we talked about last year, first there was Harvard, and then it was conceived that they were drifting too much, they were getting too liberal, so Yale came up. Then Yale was thought to be too far out, so Princeton came up. And these different factions they said, let's get one seminary that can put it all together, called Union Theological Seminary. It's still around today. Today it would be known as pretty liberal, pretty far left. Some of the big names in American political slash religious history come out of, of uh, Union uh, Theological Seminary. Charles Briggs follows a tradition that new professors got to do. You give a speech, you give, a, you give a, an address to the faculty when you take your new position. It's kind of like your coming out party. And you, you say, you know, here's my scholarship. I'm glad to be part of your organization. Let, let me share with you some of where I'm coming from. And what Charles Briggs does is he's <laughs> saying, this is where I'm coming from. You know, I'm not going down the path that you guys are going. 
Well, he doesn't give that up. He keeps pushing, and eventually, they have a trial, and they convict him of heresy. They say you're not, you're not allowed, you know, teach that. But he has tenure, so they can't kick him out. But the next two guys that follow him, yeah, they're they're gone. So there is a split in a very public split in the Presbyterian world that starts up. William Clark says, here's a leftist, a liberal uh, perspective for systematic theology. Always in the past, the idea was the Bible is a scientific book. The Bible contains all that you need to know. And science, science, if it means anything, means parsing the Bible out so that you can tease out all of the truths that are included in there. So you study the Bible for, for what it has to offer to you. Clark says, not so fast. Now, Wayne, here's, here's, the, here's the tent peg driven into the earth. 1909, there's Schofield, um, I'm trying to think of his first name, it won't come to me. Um, in any event, he, he does something no one else could do at that time, which was to take Darby's notes, which are jumbled and not particularly well organized in terms of, you know, one thought and thoroughly, thoroughly developed. As a speaker, I guess he was great, and as a personal, um, a personal uh, persuader, people people loved to listen to him. But when you tried to read him, that wasn't so so good. So Schofield, who is himself kind of a character, gets recognized by Moody. One of the things that Moody had was an amazing ability to look at people and say, I don't care where, where you come from and what you've done. You know, if I see that God can use you, I'm gonna bring you into my tent and I'm gonna find a way to maximize your potential. So he encourages Schofield and Schofield gets some money, gets some help from people that Moody knows and he spends a year or two, I, I think it was, <coughs> and he, rewrites the King James Bible, not retranslating it, but explaining it mm -hmm. verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and putting the explanation on the same page as the text itself. That was what was brilliant. Always before, you have what's called concordances. What's a concordance? Pretty much any Bible that you buy today is going to have a concordance. Maybe a little column down the middle. These are verses that are keyed to other verses. So, you know, if you want to read other verses that relate back to it, you know, you use the concordance and go, you know. Schofield's going to go much further than that. Schofield's going to say, this is what it means. And it means this in the context of dispensationalism, in the context of how this is related to how the world is going to end and when Jesus is going to come back. Yeah? Does this, re when, we, when we talk about this reference Bible, is that based on a single individual or is that based on a group of individuals that came up with it? Well, it's based on Darby primarily. You know, so, but it's one, much, per one person's interpretation? Pretty much. Okay. But it's it's brilliant. There's there's just no two ways about it. And it's published by one of the primary best known publishing houses in, in America, Oxford. And for some reason Oxford was kind of on the ropes at the time financially, and this got him well in a hurry because it sold gazillions right away. And it wasn't just dispensationalists. That, and by the way, I need to make a point I didn't make earlier. You can't identify a dispensationalist at Messiah 
or Good Shepherd where we came from or any other mainline church because they're everywhere. They're everywhere, they're everywhere. But there are also churches that that's all they do. That's all they start from. So you can believe that um, Charles Nelson Darby and uh, Schofield got it right in terms of their analysis. It's just that your church leaders probably won't go there with you. But you can have big swaths of people that would believe pieces of the fundamentalist world's way of thinking or, in fact, premillennial dispensationalism. Okay. Let's go back and remember what we talked about maybe six months ago. Where, where does the millennium come from, this idea of the millennium? Is it Revelation? That's right. Where in Revelation? Beginning or end? You got a 50-50 chance. <laughs> no. <laughs> it comes in Revelation 20, next to, next to the very, very end. There's only a chapter and a half, basically, after that. So, the millennium idea is Christ will be on earth ruling for how long? Thousand years. Millennium thousand says? Years. Thousand years. Thousand years. <clears throat> okay. So, the big question for these guys is, when is Jesus coming? Is he coming before the millennium? That's a pre. Or is he coming after the millennium? That's a post. Or, to a lesser extent, it also, there's another group in the middle that says, the millennium's already here. We're already in it. That's the reign of the church. The pre-millennium people say, first comes the rapture, when Jesus saves his church, those who, those who are true believers, then he comes, and the, then comes the tribulation, a period of, of awfulness. Jesus comes, and then, the, then you have the rule of, of Jesus. That's the pre-millennial um, time frame. So, so, Jay, Jay, so, so the millennium happens first, and then Jesus comes. In in, in the, pre in pre millennium. Yeah. That, that's okay. All right. I just yeah. want to make sure that, that you're just okay. Yeah. All right. Jesus. Well, Jesus comes before the millennium happens. Oh. Pre millennium. That's it's all to start with about when Jesus comes. Okay. The millennium is a period of peace. People mix that up because they say millennium is the period of tribulation. No, tribulation is what's described in all these awful scenes from Revelation. That's when every and and the original version that Darby says is that's the Jews going through their troubles. That's the end of history to the Jews. But then once that's over, then Jesus will come again. And then the millennium will start. So he doesn't come back once, he comes back twice. First to rapture the church, and then to start the millennium once the tribulation is over. Wild stuff. But, you know, as I told you guys last year, they're really focusing on the end first. It's, it's like we used to, I, I remember very much um, John Connolly, the governor of Texas. Someone said of him that when he gets served a steak, he doesn't eat from the outside in like normal people. He eats from the inside out. He cuts it out and he takes the middle part, the best part first. He takes dessert first. You know, so that's... <laughs> oh, we got someone. <laughs> You do the same thing. Huh? No, she eats the dessert first. <laughs> so, the Federal Council of Churches is a creation of the liberals. Let's see if you can recognize some of this. Church should stand for equal rights. Well, don't argue about that. Right of the workers to organize and get. Does that sound like something you'd hear from Pastor Bob or Pastor Jay as a sermon week after week? 
No. Conciliation and arbitration and industrial relations, look at what they're focusing on. Back to that question that I told you, kind of keep in the back of your mind. What's the focus here? Is Jesus here? Well, Actually, they say the kingdom yeah. of God is here, so <laughs> Jesus is there. Abolition of child labor, who's against that? The we owners. Need, we need cheap labor, right? The business owners. Child labor's cheap. No, no more sweatshops. Reduction of hours, oh, I like that. No more seven day weeks. Is that again the kind of thing that you'd expect to see preached week after week? You can look this up. This is 1908 though. This, this is taken right off the web. Okay, so this is the first organization of churches together for a, a common purpose. Let me do a couple more of these and then I'll turn you loose because I want to get to the fundamentals which we've talked about a bunch of times. And this is the stuff that's produced here in LA by the oil magnates, the Stewarts, Lyman Stewart in particular. Now, what's in the fundamentals is not a diatribe against evolution. That's a misnomer. It's there, but I'm not even sure it's in the first issue. There are 12 issues. And as, as they get produced, they get sent out to everybody and their brother that has anything to do with the church anywhere. So we saw Walter Rauschenbusch, his theology of the social gospel and his, um, his companion volume about uh, liberal Christianity becomes kind of the second Bible for people in that movement. Here we go with the Presbyterians laying out if we're gonna if we're gonna have an, a set of ideas that are the fundamentals here they are five of them five becomes six or five becomes doubled up at the end the last one because um, the the presumption of, of miracles gets changed with and tied to um, bodily resu resurrection. It gets reformulated a little bit from time to time, but these are the five that, that you hear about again and again. Comes, comes 1919 and the fundamentalist world gets a new champion and I'll have to tell you about him next time because it'll take me a few minutes. I'm, I was chagrined to find out about William Bell Riley because he was, he was active a couple of miles from where I lived when, when I first graduated from college and his seminary slash university that he started um, was probably two and a half miles from my house and I didn't I didn't know anything about him but he's the one who organizes drives home the idea of fundamentalism becomes a gadfly everywhere and it's a buddy of his that finally attaches the name fundamentalism to the movement that he starts why is he important to us? Two things in particular, in addition to his role here as kind of the unannounced leader of the fundamentalist world, is number one, he's the one who starts the big drive against evolution in the schools. He makes that his personal crusade, and he goes everywhere. And he persuades William Jennings Bryan to testify in the Scopes trial. First of all, he helps get the law passed, and then he he was going to uh, testify himself, but he needed to be somewhere else for another fight that was going on, so he didn't go there. He's lucky he didn't, because he would have been pilloried by the opposition that was smarter than they were. So he starts a university. 
he tries to do some things locally and in the Baptist world, and he gets punched in the face, and he almost, almost wins, but never, never quite wins. So he's he's a powerful figure, and I think basically what he did theologically is he retreated to this university that he started, and it was pretty successful, called Northwestern. You may have heard of it. Toward the end of his life, when he figured he was going to die, he went back to another guy that he had tried to get engaged before, and he said, you have to take over from me. I'm not going to give it to the people that I've hired. I need you to do it, and I'm telling you, this is God talking to you. You do not have a choice for this. God is commanding you to take charge of this university. Guess who that is that he told to do that? Who's up and coming the new superstar in the evangelical slash fundamentalist world? Billy, Billy Graham. Graham. So that's how this stuff starts folding together into our world. That's where we pick it up next week. Thanks for hanging around. Thank you.